ecosystem, focusing on the decarbonisation journey that we're now all on. My name is Josh Buckland. I'm a senior fellow at Policy Exchange and before this worked in government in a range of roles in Number 10, the Treasury and in Bayes on energy and climate related issues. We've got a great panel today um, and we really hope for an open discussion um, with a very good uh, set of audience related questions which is the key focus um, once we've got through the opening segment. Um, we've got an hour, we'll finish um, bang on 12.30 um, and please do keep your questions short and to the point um, to mean that we can get through as many as we possibly can over the course of the next hour. Um, there will be time as I said for Q&A but I am going to start with some opening statements from the, from the rest of the panel, introduce them as they go down the line. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to set a little bit of the agenda for the conversation um, today. Um, the transport system is always under the political microscope, it's safe to say, whether it be the state of our privatised rail system that many people would have tried to travel on this morning, um, whether it be the state of our roads, uh, the challenges we've had on airport capacity, the transport system is a constant political tool of debate and something that is not going to change in the coming years ahead. We're going to see that get even more pronounced in the event that we start to think about the journey to net zero. The decarbonisation of the transport system will require really significant changes to the way we drive, the way we travel, fly, as well as also potentially big questions around behaviour change, as well as also new ownership models and intriguingly, obviously, new technologies. And that is going to create real political challenges for this government, but also for governments to come. So the focus of today's discussion is to try and get into that uh, mindset a little bit. Think about how far we've come on that journey thus far, some of the technology challenges that we've got, as well as thinking quite carefully about what more needs to come in the coming years ahead, and also try and get into some of the more difficult strategic challenges. How do we pay for the future of the transport sector? How do we ensure that the transition to decarbonised tra transport is done in a fair and equal way? So that's the tone of the discussion today, and hopefully we'll get into some of the more difficult, tricky political questions um, in the Q&A session. So to kick things off, um, I'm going to start with some opening remarks, and I'm going to turn first to my left to, to Lucy Fraser, who is the Member of Parliament for South East Cambridge and now Minister of State for Transport. Uh, Lucy has been a Minister uh, for a number of years and has served in a range of departments, including the Treasury and the Ministry of Justice. So if I turn to you, Lucy, to kick us off with some opening thoughts before turning to the rest of the panel. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, and I didn't count, but I noticed that Josh said challenges uh, a few times. Uh, when he kicked off his remarks. And I thought I would start with two challenging statistics. Uh, the first is that transport takes up 24% of our emissions, and 90% of that 24 is caused by road transport. Uh, in the context where we have said, as a government, we are going to hit net zero by 2050, that's a massive challenge. Um, but we could also see it as a massive opportunity. And I say that in the context of the fact that uh, we were the ones who, uh, who established the jet engine. We were the ones uh, that uh, built the first turbine, the first tube system. So we as a nation are hugely innovative. And I think at the moment we are at a massive crossroads. And what this opportunity brings is, and you'll have heard this word quite a lot over conference so far, is potential for growth, uh, innovation, and us to be, as a nation, at the leading and cutting edge. So just in relation to roads alone, we have the potential for 72,000 jobs and 9.7 billion input into the UK economy uh, through prospective innovation. Uh, and it is all possible because we reduced our carbon emissions by 40% at the same time as increasing growth in the UK uh, by 75%. Uh, but I'm here as a government minister, so I thought I would just touch on the three ways that I think that government can influence uh, and impact this journey that we must take to decarbonisation at the same time as encouraging growth. And the three ways that government recognises that uh, it, it must go down and establish are regulation, uh, investment, and infrastructure. Uh, and we have already significantly gone down that path and made a number of commitments. So in terms of regulation, uh, you will know that we are putting in place a framework to uh, phase out fuel with our ZEV uh, mandate, our uh, non-zero emission road vehicles uh, by 2040 at the latest. 
We are legislating for self-drive, uh, and we also need to legislate for e-scooters. On investment, the government has made significant investment uh, to get down to net zero. Uh, but we have two specific funds, which I think are extremely interesting. There's the SAF fund, 165 million, to ensure that we have uh, five commercial sale SAF plants, five demonstrator plants in the UK. And we've got the 206 million pound UK shore fund. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, We've spent £2.5 billion worth of support on EV transition, of which 1.6 is used to support charging infrastructure. Uh, you will, I'm sure, know that we've committed to having six rapid chargers in motorway service stations by 2023. And we also have a, a significant fund for local authorities, £450 million, to ensure that we have uh, charging facilities for those without off-street parking. So those are the three things that government is working on. Uh, but I do think we need to think even bigger, and I know that uh, government historically has looked at this, but how do we do cross-modal transport? How do we lead, continue to lead uh, the way internationally? And how do we use better data, uh, data that government holds at the same time um, as working with the private sector to ensure that we use data to our best advantage on this journey to transformation and transition? Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. It was a really good overview of the, the government's approach, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the questions around the future of the new policy framework. The Zeb mandate, I know, is on a lot of people's minds, so um, I'm sure we'll come to that under the Q&A. Um, I'm next going to bring in uh, Peter Flynn, um, and thanks to the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, who are our partners on today, today's event. Um, Peter is a former uh, president of the IMACE and is a chartered engineer with a long history in British business, including at BAE and, and at Leyland, so he'll bring, obviously, a, a very different view. Um, so, Peter, why don't you give us some open Thoughts. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Joss. Yes, yeah, so I uh, am a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, we have 112,000 members uh, worldwide. Uh, we're joined today by our current president, Phil, with the impressive looking gong on, and uh, two members of our, our policy and, uh, and communications team. So we're, we're widely distributed around the world as, as members. Um, our members have a wide range of opinions, as you can expect. Um, mostly well informed by practical experience uh, and many if not most of those uh, members will be working on decarbonisation projects, energy efficiency uh, and things of that sort. Uh, we're strengthening in fact our policy team and we, we work both independently uh, and through the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, in the context of, of any project um, and decarbonisation is arguably the biggest engineering project mankind has ever undertaken. Uh, we ask people to, to look at three things. The technology itself, uh, how that technology is stitched together as systems, and thirdly, economic and commercial factors. So in the context of transport technology, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, electrification is generally the most efficient solution uh, near where it uh, can be made to work. And it's very well established on passenger cars, although it is too expensive. Uh, the situation on larger vehicles, which have much heavier duty cycles, uh, is, is different. Um, so I'm talking here of trucks, buses, rail, aircraft and ships. Rail, of course, has the advantage of a long history of electrification, uh, and that, of course, can be extended, limited really only by uh, cap capital expenditure versus uh, usage. Um, beyond batteries, uh, and in, they are actually making inroads into areas that I didn't expect. They're finding their way into heavier vehicles than I would have expected a few years ago. Uh, but beyond batteries, obviously, the potential solutions are hydrogen fuel cells, uh, hydrogen internal combustion engines, uh, and uh, synthetic fuels derived from um, non-fossil sources, uh, which Lucy referred to, uh, talking about sustainable aviation fuels. So those are the, those are the principal technologies related to transport. Um, but we always encourage our members to consider the wider picture, system engineering, uh, both in a technical sense uh, and in the case of transportation, obviously in the, in the sense of people and what people will or won't do. Um, it's always good if you can look at the system from end to end, and the, the phrase well to wheel uh, has been used for quite a long time. Probably wind to wheel would be more appropriate these days, 
uh, but in, in, in engineering terms, uh, looking at that uh, overall efficiency uh, is always a good start point. Um, but people play a big role in these things and encouraging people to work uh, and to shift towards other modes of transport is, is something that we should always try to encourage. And then in terms of economic factors, well, you know, we live in a free market society uh, and ultimately people will vote uh, with their wallets. Um, so the debates, for example, around the potential role of hydrogen uh, will ultimately, I think, be resolved by efficiency and hence uh, cost factors. So in conclusion, I would say that our role as engineers is to uh, pr produce things which are affordable, uh, which are reliable, and which can be produced in volume. Uh, and uh, a final thought in this context is that what's economically feasible is, is as important, if not more important, than what's technically possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. A really good assessment of kind of the overall technology landscape as well as some of the bigger challenges we're going to face on the, on the behaviour side, as you've said. Um, I'm next going to bring in uh, Andrew Gilligan, who is a former special advisor in number 10 and also uh, works as a senior journalist um, as well as at City Hall um, under uh, his role, including on TFL. Um, so I'm going to ask Andrew just to give his opening thoughts. Thank you. Um, I, I think, um, and, and the government I work for thought that electrification of the of the road vehicle fleet was the single biggest thing we could do to reduce what are stubbornly high carbon emissions from transport. But I was always worried that some policymakers thought it was the only thing we needed to do, or at least the only thing they were comfortable talking about. Um, it cannot be the only thing. So the trajectory of EV uptake is quite encouraging. The journey is only in one direction, but there are quite a lot of headwinds. Um, the rise in the price of some metals, of chips, 90% um, of, of ICE cars are bought on leasing deals, as you know, where the customer effectively pays the cost of the depreciation. At the moment, the market for EVs is assuming quite conservative levels of depreciation, which means it's much more expensive to buy um, an EV, um, roughly a third higher at the moment. So cost parity, which Bloomberg New Energy Finance was estimating is happening in about 2024, is going to be cut, pushed back, I think. Um, and obviously, globally, there are only about 16 million EVs on the road today out of 1.2 billion cars. Um, and, and the rate of conversion is going to have to dramatically accelerate um, if, if, there are any, um, uh, if, if there are any hopes of meeting all the targets we set ourselves. Even if, however, even if none of that was the case, even if everything were going entirely according to plan, um, the, the Committee on Climate Change has assessed in this balanced pathway that EV deployment can only get us two-thirds of the way towards the reductions in surface transport emissions we need for CB6. EV manufacturer, of course, carries a substantial carbon load, and there is a real risk that because EVs are taxed more lightly than petrol vehicles and diesel vehicles, they'll be driven more, um, so cancelling out some of the carbon savings. Um, indeed, as we've already seen, the adoption of more fuel efficient ICE vehicles didn't lead to carbon reductions because people just bought bigger vehicles and drove them more. Um, I think other new tech also has the potential to increase carbon emissions. Um, you know, driverless vehicles, I think, may be the revolution that never quite arrives. Um, but if it does arrive, it will significantly lower the barriers to car use. You know, you won't need a license or insurance or a parking spot or a test or, of course, a personal car at all. So why would anyone bother with public transport? Why would anyone bother with a with a bus or a train. Yet though driverless cars will be more efficient users of energy and road space than a private car, obviously they can platoon, they can bunch together, they will be significantly less efficient users of, of road space and energy than a bus or a metro train. Um, and also, by the way, they will lead to massive congestion on, on the streets of our cities. Um, Micromobility, again, another kind of magic answer often um, pushed at us when I was in, in government. Um, fairly marginal technology. All the evidence is they replace more journeys which would otherwise have been walked and, cycle, and cycled rather than journeys which otherwise have been driven. So there's again a carbon increase, not a saving. Um, so all that lead, led, led me and the government I work for to conclude that we had to start talking about behaviour change, essentially driving less. Um, and that is more difficult. So COVID may have made it easier. Um, it's uh, uh, obviously, it's reduced overall demand for travel quite substantially. Um, less commuting uh, by both rail, bus, and by car. 
uh, but uh, we had a pretty ambitious programme of um, investment in walking and cycling and public transport, um, which I hope the new government will maintain, because it's really the only way, actually, of um, uh, both of meeting the decarbonation, decarbonisation goals we've legally set ourselves, um, uh, of fully meeting them, and it's the only real way that um, cities can continue to function. Um, you think about this, there's been a, a rise in demand for road space in cities, um, about a third over the last 25 years, maybe a bit less, um, the, there's only really three answers to that. Either you build more roads, which is politically and, um, and I think financially and, and practically impossible in most places. People don't want bits of their cities knocked down to build new roads. It's almost impossible to get a new road built in an urban, a densely populated urban city now. So you can't build more new, new roads. Second option is you build more railways. Again, that is more possible. It takes a long time. Um, as we've seen with Crossrail, it's taken almost 30 years from uh, conception to opening. It's very expensive indeed, and it only serves a relatively small part of the city. Um, the other option is you introduce some kind of road pricing. Um, at some point, that bullet will have to be bitten. Um, uh, we will not, um, we, you know, obviously the, the arrival of the, the dominance of electric cars is going to mean a, a massive hole in, uh, in our tax revenues. Um, equivalent to roughly 7p on income tax. Somebody's got to fill that. Um, electric cars, of course, don't pay petrol, uh, don't pay fuel duty or, or, uh, or VED. Um, the other, but the fourth thing we can do is make better use of the roads we've already got um, by incentivizing forms of transport like buses and bikes that take up less space. And that really is the only way, I think, in the short term. All, all the other options seem to me to be too politically difficult in the short term, and too politically uh, and, and too potentially costly. Um, that really is the only way I can think of to keep our cities moving. Um, so we had a pretty substantial investment in buses and bikes, um, two, billion for, uh, two billion of new money for walking and cycling, three billion of new money for, uh, for buses, um, all predicated on the construction of proper bus and bicycle priority in, uh, in, in, in cities um, and because all the evidence shows that, that is the only thing that actually gets people out of their cars and onto buses and bikes um, and that was the you know the quite well thought through um, policy that we had um, and I as I say I really do hope it survives the uh, the, uh, the arrival of the new government but uh, I'm, I'm hearing slightly worrying things that it might not um, but that is that is broadly where I am um, where I am on decarbonisation I think um, what we're doing on, uh, on EVs is very important, and it's probably about two-thirds of what we need to do, but the other third um, is also terribly important and must not be abandoned. Thanks, Andrew. Really, really good overview. I'm sure people are keen to get to some of the areas where the new government might be changing course. And also, we should definitely probe Andrew on his views on Andy Burnham. We had a good conversation previously about the role of local mayors and their importance in transport decarbonisation. Um, continuing the theme of what seems to be a bit of a takeover by the Sunday Times. I'm now going to bring in <laughs> Nicholas Helen, who is the current transport editor uh, at the Sunday Times and has held various other senior roles in journalism over his career. Um, and I understand you're a pretty, well, maybe an understatement would be an avid cyclist, I think, from what I've heard. Um, but over to you for some opening thoughts, Nicholas, before we open it up. So I'm feeling very smug today because I came by train and I got a message saying that by doing so, I'd save 70% of carbon compared to if I'd come by car. My immediate reaction was, is that really all? Because I'd have come by myself, southwest London to here. And actually, if I'd come on my own, I would have been typical of almost every other motorist in Britain. It's about 90% of all trips now to work by car, it's driving alone. For all journeys, it's about two thirds of all cars you drive alone. The important point is that's gone up by about 4 or 5% in the last eight years. Let's do some maths now. There are about 32 million cars on the road. Let's try and think of those numbers. That shift during the period when we've all been thinking about decarbonisation. And let's keep another number in mind. The number of fully electric cars on the road, about, what, 530,000 or something. Let's do 5% of 32 million and then look at half a, half a million EVs. You can see where I'm going on this. Because of behaviour change, because we want to do our own thing, we completely wipe that out. That's not even the start of it. As Andrew referred to, cars have got bigger and fatter. They're about 208 kilos heavier now 
than they were at the start of the century, new cars. We've had the biggest weight gain of any European country. That's, what, two adults and a teenager, and I think that means every 100 k's you're burning an extra 1.3 litre of fuel. OK, so we've gone backwards. I could do that same exercise for every mode of transport without much trouble, and I'm just, I'm just playing around at the edges here. So what's the lesson? Number one, technology alone doesn't do the job. There's some great shiny technology. Um, we have to combine it with behaviour change if we're serious. Let's move on to the next thing, money. Um, we all, we all, well, we used to talk about equality, social equality, all that sort of thing. Let's run some very quick numbers. When you buy a new EV, you're getting about, on average, 1,100 quid subsidy in the first year, just through showroom tax, uh, excise duty, etc. Never mind the um, savings on fuel. OK. The, let's try and think of a manufacturer. Here's one, Tesla. Used to be worth a trillion dollars. Worth about, what, 750 billion now. I don't think Elon Musk needs our subsidy. When I bought this iPhone, I didn't ask for a subsidy from the government. When I got my first one in 2007, I didn't ask for subsidy. Bigger point I'm making, there's a real social equality issue here if we're, if we're, if we're actually serious about putting these big sums of money in. Draw back a bit, there's actually a, once we get a bit more realistic about what we're doing, we can actually analyse. We've got money to play with, but where do we put it and what's fair? And at what point do you say we're kick-starting a market so we accept that it's unfair? We're at, we have big subsidy. I think the government actually missed a trip. They, they always say we've put in about 16 billion. We haven't into trains. About 26 billion in the first two years since COVID. Big, num big money. Again, poorer people don't use trains as much. So we, al we always have to think about these things. But what we're missing sight, losing sight of here is that sometimes the really boring things, and credit to Mr Gilligan with his buses, the boring things are actually the ones which can make the difference. Because something which nobody talks about at certainly the transport conferences I go to is the um, fall off in public transport use in the last couple of years. The, the, the good thing for policymakers, we've had lots of opportunities to test out, out propositions. Um, we could easily, as, as some European countries have done, go for, say, zero-cost public transport and just play around with that in a couple of towns. We are doing that with buses in winter. Um, the, I can see my time is probably running out, but I think, and, and a quick sight, just to get Andrew gingered up, cycling, great. However, Chris Boardman, who's the boss of the, the body which Andrew established, he said to me in terms... They're trying to reach 50% walking and cycling in towns and cities by the end of the decade. At the moment, 40, we're at 45%, 43% of which is walking. So let's not get too carried away with cycling. The point about um, having a bit of a reality check on some of this stuff is just to say, we've barely started. We ha we, there's a lot of easy stuff to tackle, but then we look at the hard stuff. Quick reference on easy stuff. I mentioned public transport. Have a look at air aviation. They've got a long process of called, through an uh, organisation called ACOG where they're trying to sort out um, flight paths. If they got on with it, that would save 10% of carbon. They've taken forever on that. Tougher stuff. Two quick examples, then I'll stop. Number one, airport expansion. If you look at the Climate Change Committee, the actual situation we're in... We can't exp all the airport bids which have gone in for expansion, they go way over the 2050 targets, even if we have huge technological change. The real thing government should be thinking about is which airport in which part of the country do we allow to expand. Final nasty, Andrew mentioned road pricing. In the days when electricity was cheap, it was quite a simple thing to say to EV owners. You, ten months ago, there, some of them could go at a penny a mile. Say, so you're going to have to pay... Not the petrol ones, they're paying anyway. We don't need to overcomplicate it. Trouble is, we're now at quite a few charges are now one pounds per kilowatt hour. Used to be 20, 30p, and at night on things like octopus, you'd sometimes get it for nothing. So the politics of that suddenly got a lot harder. So there's some nasty things to come up, but I do think we need a bit of reality check because 
then we can see where things really make a difference and where they don't. Great. Well, thanks, Nicholas, and a, a good a good challenge, especially on the on the latter rate pricing point. Um, so we're now going to move into some, some Q and A. As I come around the audience, there should be a raving mic somewhere or other. Um, just uh, do stick up your hand as you're now all doing, um, and uh, make sure you just introduce yourself very briefly. Can I stress again, speeches are for the conference hall, so please keep questions as questions and relatively short and to the point. Um, so I will start off, uh, I'll take two at a time, if that's all right. And I'm going to start off with the lady there and then also the gentleman just in front of her in the blue shirt. Hi, good morning. I'm Kate Jennings from Logistics UK. So we represent the operators and infrastructure providers, buyers and suppliers in the logistics industry. Um, my question is really, you know, what do the panel think about zero carbon logistics? Really welcome what Lucy said about the need to think cross-modally, and, and Peter also mentioned systems thinking, you know, so it seems to me that now is the right time to think, where are you using hydrogen? You know, what are your plans for electrification? Why not do the railways first, because you've got the technology? Um, but yeah, <coughs> what do you think about logistics? Thank you. Thanks. Gentleman in front of you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Steve Arder-Walter, I'm the Environment Lead at West Berkshire Council. Um, question, I think, initially for Lucy is on, again, road pricing, which several people have talked about. And this has been discussed for a long time. It's obviously hugely politically difficult and so forth. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether a cross-party, allegedly depoliticized approach to this might be the way forward, Grant, uh, accepting it's going to be a long-term challenge and binding in at least one of the major opposition parties so that we see long-term progress. Thank you. Thanks very much. Very good question. And um, uh, having worked on road pricing in 2014 with Oliver Letwin, I can safely say that <laughs> the situation doesn't seem to have changed a huge amount since. So it's, a good, it's a good question. And I'll come to that in a second. On the logistics question, kind of the role of the freight industry as well as kind of the whole system point, I'm going to actually bring in Peter first, I think, just on, on that point, and then we can um, pass that around and then come to road pricing. Peter? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Thanks for your question. And I, I did sort of allude to an answer, uh, you know, in my sort of opening remarks. And... Um, as I said, I think electrically um, battery-powered vehicles are the, are the most effective solution and possibly limited by the availability of the right materials. Uh, and clearly in the case of, uh, road tran of uh, transport of, of goods, uh, the weight, probably less so the actual volume of them. Uh, but, um, but I'm encouraged by you know, some of the vehicles that are available to purchase now, uh, which you might describe as medium-duty. Um, which suggests that um, the, the upper limit, if you like, of battery-powered vehicles is probably a little bit higher than, uh, than we might previously have, previously have thought. Uh, and I, am, I have had some contact with, uh, with companies, more in buses actually than trucks, uh, that are running both well, well, internal combustion engine, battery and hydrogen-based vehicles. Uh, and they've, they've basically found the battery vehicles to be very good, whereas at the present moment, anyway, the hydrogen ones are quite expensive both to buy and to operate. Um, but I, I think it, it is the case that, um, that vehicles at the upper end of the range, in terms of both weight and range, uh, w w will find it difficult to, uh, to have uh, you know, battery-powered solutions uh, unless we can find ways of ch recharging them on the fly. And that's, that's technically possible. Um, whether it'll sort of work in practice economically and in other respects, uh, I'm, I'm less sure. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think it's, you know, in the, in the long run, it, I think it is, you know, feasible to, to get an extremely high level of, of decarbonisation. Um, and and the, the point I haven't referred to is synthetic fuels. Uh, it's talked about quite a lot for uh, aircraft and shipping, um, but it, it's also possible uh, for, you know, for road vehicles as well. Thanks, Peter. And Andrew, could I bring you in just on that question, but then maybe also just then tilt to road pricing, and then I'll come back to Lucy. On logistics, I think the low-hanging fruit is um, last-mile logistics in towns. Um, very little has been done on that. A lot more should be. Um, so we're funding a, a thing called the Zero Emission City Project. Um, there are three candidate cities, Norwich, Oxford, and Bristol, um, £50 million of funding. That includes a, a last-mile um, uh, solution where the uh, essentially everything except perishables is delivered to depots on the city centre or the on the outskirts rather than conveyed by you know electric vehicles into the city centre. Oxford would strike me as an ideal place for that because it's, it's very congested anyway. Um, a, a small electric vehicle can, can get to more places more easily, can park more easily than a, they, they, a, a larger 
diesel van and, and um, uh, that, that's the kind of that's the low hanging fruit and, and I agree um, about synthetic fuels as well I think that's probably the way forward for the big for the big trucks and on road pricing do you want to road pricing so um, I mean I, 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 I like the idea of trying to forge a political consensus um, but you know one should never underestimate politicians cowardice and weakness about this stuff um, uh, and, and the uh, the you know the the, the I, I, you know, the, the I, I don't know if Labour um, would would would, uh, would would want to go for it. Um, I think that they might see the opportunity to score a few political points instead. But it's terribly important because, you know, um, VED, vehicle excise duty, and um, and fuel duty raise about 40 billion a year, just under 40 billion a year, which is 7p on income tax, um, and uh, and um, it's going. Uh, EVs don't pay it, um, uh, and it's going in the next 10 years or so. And because it's going to be politically difficult, I think we need to start talking about it openly now um, uh, in order to try and get uh, a conversation going so, we, so, it, so it can be accomplished without too much political pain. Um, but it's, it's about boiling the frog, I think. You've got to start getting people used to the idea gradually. I'd say as well that the political space for this is expanding. Um, it, it's, it, is diff it, it is actually different. It has moved on, I think, from, from, from 2014 and certainly from 2007 when the Labour government at the time rather rashly started talking about it almost at random, provoking huge backlash. Um, I don't know if you, you know, the Northern Research Group, um, they call for road pricing in a 10 point plan for levelling up um, with the proceeds given to Northern authorities. Um, the Transport Select Committee has done a report supporting road pricing. Um, a few months ago. Um, there still is a government response to that, by the way. Um, the AA and the RSC uh, have also both called for road user charging with an allocation of three miles. The SMMT called um, last year for an independent review into it. Um, lots of backbenchers on the Tory <coughs> right, Andrea Leadsom, people like that, have called for road pricing. Lots of free market think tanks also support it because obviously they see you know the, the the state's treatment of road space as a free good as uh, as silly the Adam Smith Institute and then lots of people on the lots of think think tanks on the left as well um, the IPPR the A um, the IFS also supports it. Um, we said in our in our ten point plan um, that we did in November 2020, um, motoring taxation will have to keep pace with the change to electric vehicles. It's a careful phrase devised by me to sort of open the door without really taking you too far but that's as far as we've got so far I'm afraid the PM was always a bit reluctant to go any further but at some point we're going to have to. Great thanks uh, and, and Lucy obviously we, the, the Transport Select Committee hasn't been responded to yet so if you want to use this forum to do so then you're more than welcome but any thoughts on any thoughts on the road pricing side? Um, so on road pricing I think there are two different aspects to think about um, so Josh mentioned my previous role which I was in until a few weeks ago was in the Treasury. So there are two aspects to road prices. There's an environment aspect and there's a tax uh, aspect to it. Um, and um, as I used to say, often in the Treasury, you're not allowed to um, uh, announce any spending measures without consulting uh, uh, the Treasury. So I also think there's, there's uh, an issue in relation to urban, rural versus urban areas. So it's okay having um, a mechanism for pricing of something if there is an alternative form of transport. I represent uh, a, a rural seat in Cambridgeshire and uh, there are, I represent 50 villages um, where the only means of transportation often is by car. Uh, and so I think you have to think very carefully uh, about that. Cross-party consensus uh, is always uh, is always in every area identified as the way forward, but I'm not sure uh, is often taken up. Um, but it is always good to work out things uh, that have agreement across the floor so that they are continued, uh, which, you know, the, what we're talking about decarbonisation uh, is a long-term project, not a short-term project. Shall I touch briefly on... Yeah, no, of course. On... Uh, logistics. So we recently set up the Freight Council. I'm very lo much looking forward to engaging with the Freight Council um, to help us identify the challenges and opportunities uh, for freight. Um, as many people on the panel have identified, I don't think there's one solution to HGVs. There are many, and we as the government are not 
uh, backing one thing in particular, we're exploring a whole range of alternatives uh, to fuel, uh, whether that's low carbon fuel, hydrogen, batteries. Um, cross modality is really important, as I identified. Um, last week, I was at Oxbotica, which is a self drive a company which has established the technology for self drive, uh, and it was interesting to hear that. Uh, them talk about the opportunities for self-drive, which in the first instance they think will be in industry. Um, and I think it's, it's possible uh, that the way we transport our freight across the country some years from now will change. And I do think that the self-drive, unlike Andrew, uh, is quite an exciting opportunity and it will change the way uh, that not only that we uh, travel as uh, passengers, but might also uh, change freight as well. Thanks so much. Well, I think road pricing is not off the table quite yet, which is good. I'm going to bring it, Nicholas, uh, very in brief. very briefly, and then we'll wake up again. Two very brief points. I think on road pricing, the obvious place to start is with EVs. They've got the onboard motors, uh, the monitors. Um, I don't know why you'd want to, if, if you're trying to substitute for revenue, why would you create something for petrol and diesel motorists who are paying the taxes anyway? And why embark on some incredibly complicated IT project? On, on logistics, Worth remembering, very low margin business, unlike, say, unlike our friend Elon Musk, you're not, you're not seeing people make a fortune. DFT is actually doing some quite interesting things, including some stuff with, I think somebody's talking about on-the-fly charging, some very interesting projects they're coming up with in the new year, which, which will actually come up with alternatives to fuel, which I hope you read about in the Sunday Times this weekend. There you go, good plug, <laughs> good plug, excellent. Uh, so I'm going to bring two more uh, gentlemen right at the front, and then the lady over on the back at the right. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Sam Pook. I'm from Voy Technology. We're the largest micro-mobility operator in the UK. We operate around two-thirds of the government's e-scooter trials, including here in Birmingham and also in Cambridgeshire. Our data so far has shown that around a third of our trips are replacing cars. So in urban cities to date since the trials launched for Voy, that's over six million car trips replaced. So I'm just keen to get thoughts on the future regulation of the sector, given sort of the clear potential for quick impact. I think a lot of the technologies talked about today are very interesting, but a lot of them are very long term. Um, so yeah, please get thoughts on the future regulation of the sector and also how that can you know, fit into the wider transport network. Excellent, thanks. And the lady over at the back? I'm going to try and get the microphone. Thanks, Claire. Yes, yeah, no, sorry. Sorry, thank you very much. My name is Hilary Fryer. I live in a village in Leicestershire, and I am a borough councillor and a county councillor. I live in a 120-year-old house, which is one of the newer ones, in a terrace street in the centre of a village. We have four lampposts, and five of the houses have off-street parking. My family is completely scattered from the north of England, the south of England, and France. How would you suggest I go and get my weekly shopping? I'm afraid I'm not as young as the young man who can cycle here. Also, we were going to come on by... We couldn't come by train because they were on strike, so I came with a colleague by car, and I would just like to know, a single person of my age, and I'm not unusual, Living alone, how would I get to get my go into town, communicate, and see my family? And an electric vehicle at the moment is completely out of the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to come to Andrew first on micro mobility because you mentioned that at, at the outset, and then I'll come to Nicholas just on, on the question around uh, especially rural transport. So the um, uh, stats are um, uh, disputed. So um, the uh, uh, stats from Paris show that 8% of journeys in, in their e-scooters replaced uh, journeys by car. Um, typically, US stats are higher, um, about the level you say, about a third, because public transport in the US is often very poor. Um, but, you know, even on your stats, the majority of journeys, um, are, you know, were previously not done by, by, uh, by, by high-carbon modes. So that even on your stats, there's a carbon increase. Um, what, on, on the, on, I mean, no, nobody. I mean, no, nobody's saying that people shouldn't be allowed to drive, or that um, that there's no, that you know, that, that there's obviously lots of people who have no alternative but to drive. 
Um, the idea is to just make it easier to, is, it, for people who do have choices to choose not to drive. So it, it's, it's not banning cars, it's just using cars less. Yeah, no, I, I, I get you're one of the people who doesn't have a choice. So I, I don't think there's a... I, I mean, nobody's, nobody's saying we, we stop you driving or anything like that. It's, 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 it's the, the kind of person in the city who, who maybe drives to the shop instead of, like, you know, getting a five-minute cycle ride, something like that. that that's the idea. It's not, it's not intended to stop anyone using a car if they, don't want, if they want to. Useful clarification. Nicholas? I'll pocket the compliment. Most of my colleagues in the newsroom are 30 years younger than me, so they'll, they'll have quite a good chuckle at that. But I think, um, yes, Andrew's right. I don't think the government policy is trying to, trying to change what you do anyway. The, the big thing which I think has been missing is on public transport, it's barely begun to adapt to what we call the sharing economy. So we've had Uber in Britain for, what, 10 years? They can get an app where you trust a completely unknown driver. Um, we've had some tiny experiments, which is demand-responsive transport, which I think haven't really worked or haven't made much impact. I, I, th I think there's got to be a way forward on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, actually. I think one of the, one of the great underappreciated things is like ride-sharing and things like that. There's lots of journeys for which public transport isn't suitable, cycling isn't suitable, um, but ride-sharing, for instance, is, 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 is potentially very, very useful indeed. Great, thanks. I'm going to open it back up again. Uh, gentleman here, and then I'll go around to... Actually, the gentleman in the pink had his hand up earlier, so go to him as well. Oh, we are sourcing a microphone. Start with, start with the gentleman in the pink, Claire. Come back to them. Thank you. Um, Chris Howell here from Cambridge. I'm also co-chair of Conservative Friends of Cycling. Um, so zero tailpipe emission vehicles are not by any means zero emission. And if you are taking two tonnes of electric vehicle down the shops to buy a pint of milk or a packet of cigarettes, that is never going to be environmentally friendly. Active travel has been one of the, the really great policy successes of, the, uh, of Boris's government. Um, a lot of thanks to, to Andrew, but the, the gear change policy was fantastic and it was backed up with technical guidance and Active Travel England, which has all the makings of a really high-performing authority with some really inspirational leadership. So a question really for Lucy. Um, will the current government commit to the, the target of 50% modal share for cycling and walking uh, within urban areas? And will they ensure that Active Travel England is, is properly funded in order to deliver on that target? And if not, how are we, how we going to have any credibility um, that the Conservatives are serious about decarbonising transport? Great. Excellent. Thanks. Very specific question. And the gentleman over here. Thanks, Claire. Hello, I'm, I'm Adam Tranter. I'm uh, Andy Street Cycling and Walking Commissioner. Um, and just to say that, um, but, but on Nicholas's point, from uh, only a few percent of people cycling, we see when people do invest uh, in Paris and other places that we can see large increases quite quickly. And Oxford University state that cycling will help, de and e-bikes, in fact, will help decarbonise very, very quickly along with EVs. Um, in the West Midlands, we have 41% of car journeys under three miles. Uh, in Birmingham, it's 25% of car journeys under one mile. So we really need to tackle those short journeys. I totally accept the rural argument. It might not be appropriate in other places. But it strikes me that active travel is, when the government's talking about building and growth, is one of the quickest ways to accelerate growth, rejuvenate high streets, all of the government's agenda. So really, building on the question previously, um, to, to the minister really, looking for that commitment that active travelling will be supported, the government's £2 billion for cycling and walking will be... Uh, will remain um, and that we'll keep trying to prioritise cycling and walking for short journeys. Great, thanks. I can't avoid, they're both directed at you, uh, Lucy, so I'm going to have to come to you first. Is, 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 cycling, uh, is cycling still alive and kicking uh, now that Boris Johnson's administration is gone? Absolutely, yes. Um, so you talked about, Chris, credibility. You know, we set up, the government set up Active Travel England. It committed to its £2 billion in terms of active travel. Um, and you, you will have seen uh, many developments as a result of that. Uh, we are also looking at how do you design houses better um, so that you don't have to make those last mile journeys. How, you, you know how you're going. I mean, my own area uh, in Water Beach, as you will know, we, they've designed the area to look at specifically not using your car so that you can get to Cambridge uh, very quickly. Can I just pick up on a point that Nicholas said that Andrew picked up on about, because, because you mentioned it a few times, about um, car sharing? Yes. Um, because uh, we are interested in the technology around car sharing. 
Um, you're right, other countries are more advanced on this, I think, in France. Uh, they're very much more advanced. I'm interested to know whether that's a cultural thing or whether it's a, a technological thing. Um, and uh, I, I think there's a possibility when you combine that with self-drive, uh, if, you, if you have a, an app which enables you to share a journey um, and we eventually get the technology that there, there can be an Uber which is self-driving around you, you start to get an on-demand transport system that works quite effectively. You're looking perplexed. You, you, you want to come <laughs> back very brief. I mean, I think... I'm sort of more with Andrew in terms of self-driving because <laughs> there's always a new problem down the track, right, in terms of... I, th I think Oxbotica-type delivery is fine in the next few years. Um, tax, Robo-taxi-type things, I think, will... You know, it's going to be quite a while. All, all I was pointing out was we, we have a lot more cars. It's, we're affluent. It's a problem of plenty. It's not a plenty. It's, it, it's not a shortage. And we just actually have to work out how to do it. The obvious place to start is commuter journeys to work. You already know your co-workers. That there won't be the same resistance to sharing a lift since you're already in the same building. And I think there's some very low-tech solutions. Uber yeah. have managed it on an app. It's not difficult. I mean, yeah, we, so we are yeah. interested. Mm. Yeah. The, great, the great curse of transport is the, is yeah. the technological with bangery. The, 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 the ideas, the, the things that work are really simple and boring. Buses, bicycles lift sharing it's you know we're constantly assailed by people like american funded text companies with these you know these ideas on which vast amounts of into which vast amounts of capital have been sunk and shared mobility all that kind of stuff and it, it, you know that that is that you know uh, hs2 another great example of something that's totally stupid and ridiculous um there we go and, and i really <laughs> hope the government wins <laughs> that um uh, and, and it's just you know you get so much more bang for your buck investing in small in a lot in lots of small and boring things than in these these whiz bang technological marvels peter uh, I'm going to agree with, uh, with Andrew. Uh, you, you might imagine sort of representing a technology institution, I'd be going for the sort of high-tech stuff, but my experience is quite the opposite. You know, the simplest of things are, are by far the best. Um, I, I'd like to sympathise with the lady uh, living in Leicestershire. Uh, I live in a remote village in Derbyshire. Uh, I do have two bikes, actually, but I would never cycle down to the, the shops you know, to bring my cornflakes back and so on. It's just too hilly. And so on, but I do wonder whether there could potentially be a market for, you know, quite small and simple electric vehicles, uh, without all the sort of whiz bangery, you know, something that's uh, a sort of almost like a sort of old-fashioned mini-sized uh, vehicle, which could be used for, you know, short journeys of that sort. And uh, I'm sure car car manufacturers are, are looking at the different segments of the market and have, you know, are considering that. Yeah, bring back the G whiz. There we go. I won't come to Mr. on HS2, but I'm, I'm, someone might ask that question. <laughs> I don't want to beg it. The gentleman in the white has hand a couple of times, and then maybe the lady on in the red that's next to him. That's clear. Uh, Robert McElveen from the Mineral Products Association. So it's the trade body for concrete, aggregate, cement, basically the heaviest stuff in the economy. During the pandemic, our members were able to run a lot more freight trains because there were fewer passenger trains running. And there's an a bit, there's an argument, if the minister was tempted to be bold, that you might get better use out of the existing network even before the free capacity sort of freed up by HS2 comes on stream um, by running slightly fewer subsidised off-peak passenger services for more rail freight because if we had the capacity, we would use it and each uh, train takes 76 lorries off the road or we were able to run double-length trains, so that's like 150 lorries off the road equivalent during the pandemic. So uh, a good opportunity for getting more out of the existing infrastructure. There we go, I'll take that as a question. But uh, lady on the red. Um, yes, uh, I'm basically, um, I'm sorry, Vanessa Churchman, Isle of, sunny Isle of Wight, I might add. Always. When are we going to stop the government centralizing services? We have to use our cars in rural areas to get to hospitals, to schools, you name it we have no other option because we don't have a big enough population to run what I call a proper bus service called Bums on Seats. I run a coach company, so I really do know what I'm talking about. So the, the decentralisation would help. We, on the Isle of Wight, we have one hospital in the middle of Newport. How on earth do people get there? Thank you.
Very good question. Thank you. I'm going to come to, to the Minister on the question around um, specifically freight. So this government is bold, so maybe that's a, a good opportunity there. And then do feel free to comment on the centralisation question. Then I'll come to Andrew. So I'll be quick, Robert. I think it's an interesting idea, and I'll take it away. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, Vanessa, I do think that we do have uh, decentralisation. And I, I'm in an area where we have a mayor, and the mayor is in charge of our transportation system and our bus system. Um, and so I do, I do, our charging network is rolled out to uh, the local authorities to identify, you know, they've got the 450 million pounds to identify where it's going to be appropriate for local areas uh, to put their charging sockets. So, you know, of course, central government has a role, uh, but I do think that local authorities are playing a significant role in the development of our transport system. And just while I've got the floor, Peter, the answer to not being able to cycle to get to the shops is move to Cambridgeshire, where it's not very hilly. I was going to make that <laughs> comment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Andrew, do you just want to come on I, a, a decentralisation? Yeah, I completely your... agree with you, actually, about that. I think, I mean, one of the things we've seen in the last few years is like NHS hospitals all being moved out to places where it's impossible to reach by public transport. That's crazy. It's like bits of government not being joined. So the hospital in Norwich, for instance, which I know quite well, used to be in the middle of the city. It's now right on the edge. Edinburgh Ditto, the main hospital there, has been moved from the middle of Edinburgh right out to a site um, five or six miles out. And, and my local hospital in Greenwich used to be right in the middle of, of, of Greenwich. It's now the same and um, it costs a million pounds a year to serve by bus it, it, uh, badly and, and that, that kind of thing is, is crazy and obviously the closure of courts and things people have to go a long way to get to court people have to go a long way to get to, to public services so that is very sensible although I think online can help also with some of those things obviously services that have to be delivered in person can also be delivered online um, I suppose the other thing I'd say look, just to add the point I made is if, if we are serious about decarbonisation, we have to spend our limited money on the things which deliver the most decarbonisation for the buck. That, that's why, for instance, HS2 is such a terrible mistake, because it's an enormous amount of money which is going to deliver very few, if any, carbon savings. Right, thanks. I'll come out for a final round of questions, gentlemen here, and then maybe the uh, lady in front, in front of the gentleman as well. So I'll take all three, and then we'll open up. Gentleman here, Claire, thanks so much. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah no. okay. Uh, my name is Richard Greville. I've been a chartered member of the IMEC for nearly 40 years. I've been worked in automotive and power and all of that, so I have some idea what I'm talking about. Basically, the calm dark side does not cause climate change. This is a, it's a fallacy that's been spread about all over the place. It is a result of the climate uh, warming up. So chasing this uh, carbon dark side myth is costing us huge amounts of money for nothing. What I do agree with, though, is reducing the emissions like NOx and particulates in cities. But otherwise, we are wasting money. I mean, China and India... Just push for a question. That's sorry? Just push for a question, if that's yeah. right. <clears throat> the question is, why can't we just check the facts and, and have a, a look, see it... And, change our minds on all this. Thank you. And then the lady there, and then the gentleman behind her in the white. Hello. Yeah, hi. Sandra Johnson from Costain Group PLC, who are helping to build High Speed 2, actually. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, one no, of my greatest achievements... No, 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 no don't worry. Lost. I do understand uh, different views. But we have employed 25,000 apprentices, so there is a wider economic argument for some of these schemes. But my point, actually, is to you, Lucy... From my community in South East London, not everybody can change an old car. Um, are there any incentives that the government could do to help take some of the older cars off the road? Some people are doing uh, two, three jobs, night work, different type of work. So for different reasons um, from the ladies that live rurally, they need their cars. Yep. So how can you help certain communities who are really struggling financially to you know, change their cars? Thanks. If you just pass the mic to the gentleman behind you. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Is it there? Okay. Thanks. I'm Mike Green. I'm the portfolio holder for Transport and Sustainability at Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool Council, and I'm chairman of the Western Gateway Subnational Transport Body, which reaches up sort of Bristol and beyond there. Um, 
we were talking earlier about the, the, the low-hanging fruit for freight. I've never been interested in freight in any way at all until I got that latter role. And one of the studies that we've done showed that in, in our area, which is a big chunk of the country, 24% of the vehicles, the freight-carrying vehicles, were running em- empty. So is there a low-hanging fruit there as well? And given that the industry doesn't seem to be able to, to solve that in itself, is there time for the government to intervene and to try to do something about it? Great. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to actually turn to each of the panellists. Uh, so question on the kind of climate arguments, so are we focusing on the right things? Question on how do we ensure that those in local communities have incentives to potentially replace their cars? And then finally, just on the freight side, is there any low-hanging feet that the government are missing? Peter, I'm going to turn to you first. Yes, I was slightly taken aback by the gentleman's statement about CO2 levels. And I, you know, I've done my own homework and come to my own conclusions. And perhaps I could talk to you about it uh, <coughs> afterwards. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the question of, of freight... Uh, and so on. Uh, it, it is the case that um, commercial vehicles run. I was surprised at 24% empty, but you know, if that's the figure, fine. It, it is the case that vehicles, uh, you know, run substantially below their maximum gross vehicle weight, or whatever, uh, and that uh, in other instances they they're limited by the volume of the product rather than the weight of it. Um, it's transport logistics, and you know, things have improved. There, there, I think there is a role for some aspects of legislation, particularly between countries as opposed to within, within countries. And the third point was? Just on access to uh, replacement cars for those who might need incentives to replace their old ones. Yes, um, I think ultimately um, we often get to situations, when it's, whether it's to do with internal combustion engine cars or whatever, where we sort of have to say enough's enough and we have a sort of scrappage scheme. And it would be, I think at some point we may well you know, have to do something of that sort. Um, We have committed to net zero, uh, and net zero is not only uh, something that we want to achieve, it's also, as I said in my opening remarks, an opportunity for this country uh, to to, to grow our economy at the same time. I'm really pleased the lady asked me about changing cars, but the reason I, I'm, going to, I'm pleased is because I've been keen to answer a question, well, a point that have been put to the panel about why are we investing so much uh, in electric cars that perhaps the top end of the market are purchasing? And one of the answers to that is there's a tipping point at which this then becomes available, that we, we uh, make the technology... Uh, less expensive. Uh, we get more cars into the second-hand market. We're very conscious of that. And they're cheaper for everybody. So what we want to do is to... Uh, and as part of that, we need to get the charging infrastructure in place because people won't purchase their cars unless they have confidence uh, that they're going to be able to drive them around the country. And so the government's agenda is uh, taking account all of that, and that will reduce the prices of uh, cars for everybody, but will also encourage the second-hand market so everyone can hopefully buy a car uh, at, a, at a price for them. Um, interested in points about freight, and, and we'll be discussing everything with the Freight Council. Right, Nicholas? On freight, um, I'd, I'd say by comparison, when the rail strikes happened, Network Rail suddenly started talking about all the, um, the, the antiquated industrial practices, which they never wanted to talk about before. The same thing in freight. I'll give you a simple example. You'll remember a year and a half ago or so, there was a big um, bottleneck at Felixstowe. So you've got these huge container ships coming in from China, take a lot of trucks to unload them. Guess what happens when we arrive, when we arrive at Felixstowe and have to get out? It used to be, a, until very recently, it was a single track railway. That's absolutely mad. It's like transferring onto a country lane. And even now, last autumn, November, when we had another big crunch, they removed one level crossing which enabled them to put two more trains on each day, which the figures I had were about 200 trucks off the road. That cost about 500 grand. An industrial estate, they didn't even need it. Absolute joke. But as a journalist, when you try and ask about this, they're also scared of the government. They will not talk about it. But instead of, look again, instead of always the big shiny projects, these are tiny things, and they're endless bottlenecks. Other example, Amazon, which you'd have thought would be great at logistics, it isn't. So just talk to anybody who delivers a package to your house. You'd have thought it's all super duper integrated along with the sort of stuff I hear at every conference I go to about big data. No, it isn't. It's a private individual with his own van or car 
with a load of packages in the back, using a mobile phone trying to put it together. Go to any supermarket, last point, where I live, everybody shops with the same two retailers. You'll see the same delivery man popping up at our house an hour and a half after being two doors down. He's gone three miles away. What, what's stopping the supermarkets giving proper incentives to combine, to give a wider slot? We all did it for plastic bags. So there's, there's a lot of lazy behaviour and it's all because of competition. You just, just lift, look under the rock and there's a lot of that going on. Thanks. And final word to you, Andrew. Um, I, I look, I mean, I totally sympathise with you about the Felix <laughs> so railway line. Yeah. Single track line, it's unelectrified, by the way. So um, the, main, the main freight flow from Felix, though, is to Trafford Park in Manchester, which is entirely electric, on an entirely electrified railway, apart from this seven or so miles at the beginning. And, and I spent a long time trying to get the DFT to kind of pull its finger out on increasing the capacity of that railway, electrifying it. That's unbelievably difficult. It's, a, it, it's an example of how shocking um, the government and, 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 and the railways can be about getting anything done quickly. Um, so we did get that level crossing taken <laughs> out. That's my sole trial. But it's just ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's yeah. totally ludicrous. And, and, and um, it, it's, it's much too difficult to do things on the railways, um, which is another reason why I was always... You know, keen on things like buses and bikes because it's much easier to do them. Um, but um, uh, and then on your logistics thing, I I, I, can, I agree with that as well. And essentially, the problem is that the the th there isn't enough of an incentive of them to act efficiently. No. If they had to pay a bit, you know, if they had to pay, dare I say, a bit of road pricing, they might they might um, they might act a bit more efficiently. All right. Uh, good good point to end on. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks especially to the minister who I'm sure his next trip will be to Felix Stowe by the sounds of it. <laughs> Um, it's been a really good discussion. We talked a little bit about kind of how important the EV transition is, but that's not the place to end. A lot on low-hanging fruits, especially around freight, and also a little bit on some of the more nutty issues around road pricing. So hopefully it's been helpful, and please do continue the discussion. Um, you'll be hearing more from PX on this soon. Please, uh, if you could thank the panel, and uh, thanks very much.